As the World Economic Forum meeting kicks off here with me, someone who is a Davos regular and a private equity veteran, Manish Kedriwal, managing partner of Kidara Capital. Manish, thanks so much for talking to us here. Have you picked up anything on the mood here in Davos yet? Is it looking better? Cautious optimism building up? Well, uh, Shweta, firstly, it's great to be here. Second, it's way too early. You know, we just yeah. got in today. It's yeah. just starting off. Most of the events actually start off after this evening. But uh, the weather's great. Yes, it's not I as cold case, as it is uh, usually. It's not as cold. Uh, there's lots of snow that's been snowing for the last few days. Uh, supposed to be some great skiing later on in the week. Uh, but I think overall the mood seems, while it's too early to say, not as negative as it has been the last three or four years. I think uh, we probably saw the nadir, the worst times uh, in 2009. Right. And 2010, we saw a quick uptick in 11. And 12 and 13 has been more... Uh, more down than up and i think uh, the mood this year seems more positive though it's early to say i think the indian contingent this year is surprisingly large i think it's one of the larger contingents maybe out of the u.s it's about 120 130 people it is a very large contingent and not just uh, industry leaders we've got great government presence here this time led by the finance minister of yeah course. i understand the finance minister the commerce minister Mr. Kamalnath, Arvind Mayara, Montek all supposed to be here so i think uh, so the obvious question manish is how is india really being viewed at davos because a few years ago india really used to be the flavor here everyone was talking about india's stellar growth rate and then suddenly we saw this dip the slowdown obviously meant that india had fallen off the radar of most foreign investors do you think india's perception is changing once again are people looking at india once again i think uh, again it's too early to say that i think uh, the problem we had is we probably oversold ourselves uh, in the 06, 07, early 08 period and we just didn't retain the momentum as a country, both macroeconomically as well as the performance for corporates. I think the macroeconomic, while we're seeing some early green shoots, uh, the corporate balance sheets are still badly damaged. So I don't think uh, India will be anywhere near the flavor of the day as it used to be in the 06, 07, but I think that was a hype. Yeah. And I think we have a, a, a habit of the pendulum swinging too wildly in each direction. Okay. Uh, I think it had swung way too optimistically in 06, 07, and then way, went way too pessimistic. I think if you look at uh, the basic mood in India bottom up, uh, not macro, but bottom up, well, how companies are doing, uh, barring the ones which have significant balance sheet issues and huge uh, over, uh, over leverage, frankly, it's doing fine. So I think... Uh, so but are you saying it's, be... it's, it's more balanced now between the kind of optimism we saw in 2006-07 to the kind of pessimism we saw over the last few years? Is there some sort of a balance uh, on, on, on India that's now emerging? I, I think there is. I think for the people who are smart in India, who follow India closely, that is indeed the case. That I think people are starting to re-look at India again. But I think for the broader mass of people and the broader set of investors, not the India specialists, right. I think India is still largely irrelevant. And I am sad to say that, but it's a bit like uh, not irrelevant from a, uh, from, a, uh, from a large perspective. But if you look at uh, the amount of focus that uh, a global investor has in India, it's still, uh, it's still minimal. It's still not uh, commensurate to the amount of importance we give to ourselves as a country. Okay. And I think uh, that will only happen once our corporate performance, as well as uh, the macro uh, indicators, whether it's a budget deficit, it's a current account deficit. I mean, we have great leadership on the top. We have a great new governor uh, at the Reserve Bank of India. Things right. seem to be stabilizing, but that's for all us uh, India savvy or India intense guys. For the broader uh, set of investors, India is still relatively a very small, uh, small slice. And until they see strong performance and at least some strong uh, actions uh, right. in terms of promises made, I think there will not be the level of interest we saw in the 06, 07 period. Okay, that's, that's uh, clearly something that policymakers will need to work on. You talked about stability, uh, you talked about leadership. Clearly, for, for India right now, the big event will be the Lok Sabha elections. Do you think political instability is something that is worrying investors right now? They're sort of in a wait and watch mode because they want to see what really happens in terms of the elections. Also, there have been some, some very fast-paced developments with the emergence of the Aam Aadmi Party, for instance. So how are the political developments, developments being viewed by foreign investors? So so I think if you look at the global investors, I would say there's a level of uh, wait and watch. You're absolutely right. And I think the wait and watch is uh, waiting for what happens out of the elections uh, in uh, the April-May time frame. I think 
the December results in the four uh, states uh, tended to confuse, at least the one in Delhi tended to confuse a lot of the foreign investors. Um, and I think um, uh, all the sets of parties out there, uh, I think the Congress as well as the BJP seems to have clarified at least the economic stance quite clearly. I think the, uh, it'll be helpful for the Aam Aadmi to do that, uh, Aam Aadmi party to do that. Right. I think uh, it's a great wake-up call that the party has done. Sure. I think it's a party which uh, deserves uh, its place in the sun and an opportunity. But I think there's a lot more to be done on the economic side uh, for the broader investors to get uh, comfortable. I think right now, it's uh, while all of us are very aware of what's going on with the Aam Aadmi Party, if you talk to a lot of the global investors, it's still not, they haven't realized the impact it's had on Indian politics. And, uh, sure. and, um, and I think that will be clarified in the next few months. Does it remain a local Delhi um, movement? Does it spread out? How successful are they in getting a national mandate? Do they actually get the 30, 40, 50, 60 seats sure. that they think they might? And I think that will play a huge role in determining who will be and also the stability at the center. And that, that remains a key point. Of course, we've seen major drama unfold back home in Delhi, all the theatrics with yeah. regard to Arvind Kejriwal and the confrontation. Uh, uh, but really, for investors, it would be uh, a, a fractured mandate is something that would worry them. What would be the biggest downside risk, so to say, to the India story, especially if we take into account the elections? Well, I think uh, if you put this whole thing in context, uh, my fundamental belief is there's so much capital out there in the world. Globally, there is tons of capital. Uh, the U.S. is actually resurging. The economy is really resurging. The interest, a lot of the money is flowing back. As we have the tapering happening, uh, money might get away from the emerging markets. Uh, even all that is happening, there's sort of a duality that uh, even a small... A uh, proportion of that money which goes into the emerging markets and in India can change the perspective and the markets completely. More importantly, India as a country needs that foreign capital, both as FII and FDI, if we are to make our bridges, if we are to make our roads, our general, our general infrastructure works. I mean, as the finance minister and the others have said multiple times, until we have a significant proportion of investment being funded by the foreigners, uh, it's just not going to happen. Absolutely. So I think from that perspective, it's critical. I don't think it really matters who is in power. What's clear is that there is clear leadership right. and that there is action vis-a-vis -vis the promises they've made. So I think if you look at the investor community, I don't think you'll see anyone taking sides on any of the political parties. And I think uh, uh, they're probably intrigued, but I, and I think what's though happened... I, though I have to say the markets, the stock markets yeah. and the way they had rallied the day after the state uh, election results seem to indicate that they are voting for a BJP-led government, an NDA government coming to power. I think we've learned to believe, uh, Shweta, never take the movement in the stock markets as an indicator of anything. <laughs> right. uh, I think there's so many different factors which affect the flow of the equity market, especially the public equity markets, both the domestic investors, the foreign investors. I literally don't take these. I would, we never take any messages from that. Of course, uh, there is a general sense of, uh, if there is a sense of stability and a clear outcome coming on, there will be a flood of new capital coming in, but that's temporary. I think at the end of the day, what the investor wants to see, a uh, global investor wants to see, is stability in the top, and not stability in terms of personality or party, but much more stability in terms of principles, stability in terms of the medium to long-term plans. What are they doing about the current account deficit? What are they doing about the current, about the budget deficit? What are they doing about the long-term investments right. in infrastructure, in education, in areas like that? And is there a follow-through over a couple of years, not a couple of months. So I think the short-term tendencies, that's what stock markets are made for, and that's how people make or lose fortunes to play on the short-term right. trends. Absolutely, and right now, of course, we're seeing too much populism take place. Uh, so Rahul Gandhi, on one hand, uh, is saying, you know what, we don't need just nine uh, subsidized cylinders, we need 12, and wow, it's already done. Uh, we've got the Aam Aadmi Party saying, we're going to cut your power tariffs. So populism, clearly, in times of elections, is something yeah. which isn't really the perfect recipe, doesn't make great economics at this point. No, I would agree. Um, uh, but I think when you balance that along with, I think both, uh, uh, especially Rahul Gandhi, has been talking about some other areas also. I think uh, if you look at the speech he made last week, it was a substantial change from what people were hearing earlier. Right. And I think over the next few months, I think you'll see a significant amount of clarity coming out uh, from, uh, from his office. And I think given that he's taken on the leadership 
of at least the elections, I'm actually quite optimistic that the coming elections will be, will be fought hard. It'll be very different. It'll be quite a changing point in India. I think both the BGP and the Congress will fight very strongly. And I think having the Ahmad in the background will keep sort of all the parties honest. Well, it is something, it will be clearly one of the most closely watched elections. Manish, I want to change tracks and talk yeah. a little more about uh, the fact that uh, your fund managed to raise $540 million <coughs> for a maiden fund. It is absolutely brilliant numbers. That clearly shows that the interest in India is there. Tell us a little more about the entire yeah. fundraising exercise. Firstly, a hold off on uh, any, uh, any congratulations. I think, uh, the, I think in no, most fund managers, uh, the easy part is raising the funds. The tougher part is actually deploying the funds <laughs> and making right. the money. So I right. hope we can have the same conversation three or four years from now. And we both feel equally as good. But $540 million so is, we were, is, is good money. So we were fortunate. We were lucky. I said we were lucky and fortunate. And I think, um, uh, I think it, was, uh, it was good given the overall context and the general negativism around India. Right. So the macro pulled everyone down as many teams were out there raising money. But I really think that's not the message. I think India, as I said, the micro is still really strong. Right. And if you cut through all the clutter, you still have some amazing entrepreneurs and some amazing companies in India, both public and private. And I think there's enough capital out there in the world that actually 540 is an insignificant amount of capital when you look at the amount of global capital around. So I think the way we look at ourselves is a couple of contrarian believers in India mm -hmm. uh, saw in us a safe opportunity to deploy money behind a bunch of guys who've had uh, a relatively successful uh, track record over the last 10 years and that we've seen both good and bad out of India. And it's just not me at all. It was uh, the fact that I have two other co-founders who were, uh, who were with McKinsey, at McKinsey with me, but were partners at a leading private equity firm called General Atlantic. Right. We have a partnership with a global leader called Clayton de Villiers and Rice. Sure. We have some amazing uh, operating partners such as Sanjeev Varga and Pramod Basin who are part of the team. So I think the fact is uh, the credit is due to, to that whole coming together and, uh, and a bit of luck, but I think the hard work is ahead. <laughs> right, hard work, ahead. hard work clearly, and, and when we talk about deploying those funds, yeah. uh, what are the areas that are looking clearly optimistic where you think you want to put that money in? Sure. So there, uh, Shweta, we're looking at a bunch of areas. We're relatively sector agnostic. Uh, I think our true differentiator is what we, when we, the, the three of us sat around uh, doing this fund, and we had our brainstorming sessions with our partners at Clayton de Villiers, we saw a huge amount of opportunity in companies which were undermanaged and not living up to their fundamental potential. And these could be either very strong first generation entrepreneurs at a time when they're passing on the baton to the second generation, or more likely, very diversified family owned business conglomerates where we don't think we can add value in the core two or three businesses. Right. But if there are, they have 40 or 50 different entities, there are the, 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 the smaller 20 where the promoter does not have the time uh, to focus on or additional capital to deploy behind. Sure. Especially in these times when they're doubling up on the core businesses or restructuring their own balance sheets. So we see a huge amount of opportunity in coming in as a majority partner or a minority partner with our operating partners, with people like Pramod Basin who know IT really well, Sanjeev Aga who knows uh, telecom, and the whole FMCG space extremely well. Right. And taking large stakes where our operating partners play a significant role in not turning around, that's not the point, but actually really pushing these companies up to realize their full potential. So I think sector agnostic, uh, we can take minority or controlling positions. We will take some controlling positions uh, and uh, it'll be a slightly diff a different way of investing uh, money in private equity in India. All right, here's wishing you all the luck, but let me talk about skiing and your plans <laughs> later in the week. Uh, Schumacher's accident not making a difference uh, or uh, uh, stopping you from going ahead with your skiing plans? Well, uh, I've always planned to ski here. We love skiing. Uh, the hope was to come in early this morning and do it, but that didn't happen. But the snow is finally great, so hopefully Thursday afternoon when there's relatively lesser sessions and most of my bilateral meetings are squeezed on Wednesday, Thursday morning and Friday, that we'll get out on Thursday afternoon. Schumacher is very far too great, far, very, very unfortunate, unfortunate, but also much bigger risk taker. Uh, we are uh, novices, relative novices in skiing compared to Schumacher, and we know our limits. So we'll be in not just the bunny slopes, maybe a, you know a few notches in the blue and the black trails, but uh, we'll never go off piece that he went. So I think uh, I'll be relatively okay. And there's lots of padding here. 
to keep me uh, well and awake even if I was to have a fall. All right, a risk is something <laughs> that you clearly take when it comes to your business. And here's wishing you all the luck, both with skiing and with the new fund, Manish Kejriwal. Such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Shweta. Thank Good you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.